Hello, everyone. Welcome to our first module. We're going to be talking about information processing, which is kind of the fundamental core of how we're going to look at motor behavior with a cognitive psychology perspective. So this content won't be too challenging, but this is really just the, the first building blocks. And within a few modules, we're going to get into the more complex material. But this is going to be a very important foundation. So uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the history, kind of how we've made it to a cognitive psychology perspective. Then we're going to talk about the stages of information processing, the things that occur in our mind uh, during a reaction time interval. And then we're going to apply this with Donder's subtractive logic, which is quite an old experiment, uh, but still the principles apply uh, today. And they're a great demonstration of information processing. So humans, we are unusual. And we probably don't think of ourselves that way because, you know, for us being a human is normal. But just imagine that you're an alien and you come down to Earth and you're, you're studying humans. We might do some weird things. Like, for example, we sleep for, you know, maybe eight hours a day and actually even longer when, when we're babies. And that's kind of weird, right? I mean, we know that sleep is important. It's a restorative uh, stage. Uh, and you actually can't survive without sleep. But it's an unusual thing. You think we're wasting you know, all those hours of our day. Another thing that's unusual is that we like to take risks. And some of us have different uh, penchant for risks than others. Some people like to go skydiving. Some people might find uh, ordinary things like driving to be more risk than they enjoy taking. And you might think, OK, well, what's the purpose of, of being a human? Well, it's to propagate the species and you know, pass on your genetic material. And if that's the case, you know, we wouldn't want to take any risks. And yet, some people more than others actually enjoy taking these risks. That you know, if you go skydiving and your parachute breaks, you're, you know, you're obviously not going to be able to pass on your genes. So why is it we like to take risks? Another thing that I think is, is interesting, and especially as a Canadian coming to Texas Tech, is the, the sports culture. We have professional sports in Canada, but we don't have anything like uh, the NCAA kind of level of, of competition. And seeing you know, tens of thousands of people come from you know, all over West Texas to attend a Texas Tech football game is quite a spectacle. And from the outside view, you know, it's, it's all a little silly. There's tens of thousands of people to watch a few dozen people, you know, throw around a pigskin. Now that's unusual. And yet, you know, that is something kind of fundamental to the human experience. And lastly, a, a joke from Jerry Seinfeld, if aliens saw us walking our dogs and picking up their poop, who would they think is in charge? You know, so we humans, we like to have pets and that's kind of weird. Now, these things are all within the realm of psychology and other fields as well, kind of studying uh, human behavior. Now, within this course, we're going to narrow the focus down to studying human motor behavior. So a few examples of that, and some of these we'll, we'll see later on in the course. Uh, reaching and grasping, you know, very simple movement that we do hundreds of times a day. Maybe one day I should, I should keep a count. Um, and seems very simple, straightforward, we use it all the time, and yet there's still research going on trying to understand exactly how we reach and grasp uh, an object. And this is actually something I do in my lab a bit as well. Navigation. If you think about you know, humans navigating our environment, we're all quite good at this. This is a famous intersection in uh, Shibuya, Tokyo, Japan, where they have a, a special time where instead of you know, just people go this way or this way. There's, there's a time where no cars are allowed to go anywhere and people can go every which way. <laughs> there's probably a word for it. I'm not sure what they call it, but it, it's, it almost seems like chaos. It's like, you know, four armies kind of descending on each other. And yet everyone walks through this intersection successfully, you know, hardly with ever any incidents at all. And that's fairly remarkable. Balance. You know, we humans, we're pretty good at balance. We're not built very well to be balanced in an upright uh, posture. We have relatively small feet, and a lot of our mass is in our shoulders and our head. 
And you wouldn't design a building that way. You know, that, that would be an instable building. Uh, and yet, despite our instability to our anatomy, you know, we're quite good at balancing. And with some practice, we can do very impressive things like slack rope uh, walking or uh, think of, you know, feats of, of gymnasts and skateboarders and things like that. Tying your shoes. You know, we, we can probably all do this and we, you know, can do it without a second thought. But at one point in our life, when we were young, you know, this was very hard. And it took a lot of practice and, and training to be able to do this. And now it's, it's almost like a partner dance between our two hands, you know, choreographed perfectly and able uh, in order to tie our shoes. So these are all examples of human motor behavior that we can investigate with a cognitive psychology perspective. Which we should talk about, you know, what is cognitive psychology and how did we get there? Before cognitive psychology came behaviorism. So let's talk about it first. So within the framework of behaviorism, and I should say that behaviorism and researchers within this perspective still exist today, and it's still valid and worthwhile. Within behaviorism, the perspective was that we're going to try to understand human behavior by looking at the input and the output. In other words, the mind was unimportant. And behaviorists kind of treat the mind as a black box. Yes, there's stuff happening there, but we're not going to open up that black box. We're going to leave it be and just look at what's going on with the input and the output. Behaviorism isn't as popular now as it once was. Its reign was really kind of the 1900s to the 1950s. So what's going on with input? So if we're within behaviorism, we need to think about the input. Well, we have sensory input. And we can think of our five senses. We have more senses than that, but often in elementary school, we're taught there's five. And to remember these, I like to think uh, of using them when I'm watching a movie and eating popcorn. So I can see the movie, it's vision. I can hear the movie, audition. And then with the popcorn, I can taste the popcorn. I'm touching the popcorn and I can, I can smell the popcorn. So those are maybe what we'll call the classic five senses. But we have more than that, and I'm sure you've already seen some of these in kinesiology. How many is a matter of debate? Because some sensory systems, you might say, well, they have slightly different tracks in the nervous system. We'll count those as two or one. But I'd say there's at least nine. So this, our sixth sense is not the ability to see dead people, uh, but it's kinesthesia uh, or proprioception. This is the sense of your body's position in space and the forces produced by your muscles. And some of the receptors here would be muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs. We have our vestibular system, which allows us to sense linear and angular accelerations. And that is uh, located within the uh, inner ear. So another important sense for balance. We can sense temperature. So if you walk into a room that's warmer or colder, you know, you feel that. If you, you know, touch uh, a hot mug of coffee, it feels hot. That's another sensory system. And related to sense of touch, there's also specific receptors for pain. And these, there's different types. There can be very dull pain or there can be, you know, sharp pain. And that's when some people might divide, you know, your pain, one type of sensory input into multiple systems. So that's our input. For our output, what we're really talking about is motor output. And really, movement is our primary way of affecting the world. So if we think of all the wonderful things that our brain can think about, it's all for naught unless we can then act on the world. If I have a great idea for a book in my head, that's not going to help anyone unless I can then you know, write it out with a pencil or, you know, type it on a, a keyboard. So motor output is imperative. So behaviorists are interested in the input and the output and the relationship between them. And maybe the most fam uh, famous example of behaviorism is classical conditioning. So Ivan Pav Pavlov's research. Ooh, and I'm sure you've seen this in uh, psychology before. But the idea is if, for example, you give a dog a bowl of food, it will salivate. And I'm sure if you gave me a cinnamon bun, you know, I would salivate. <laughs> now, if you ring a bell in front of a dog or in front of me, you know, or neither of us are going to salivate. 
But if over a period of weeks, every time you give me a cinnamon bun, you ring a bell, eventually those two uh, stimuli are going to become conditioned. And either one of those alone will now cause the response of salivating. So after conditioning, you know, even without a cinnamon bun, you ring a bell, I'm going to start uh, to salivate. So that's classical conditioning, you know, in a very um, brief sense. And this research does continue, and maybe a great application of it is in treating phobias, so irrational fears. And one perspective on phobias is that you have become conditioned to have a very fearful response to something that shouldn't cause you know, that much fear. And fear is normal. You know, we're born being afraid of, of things that could hurt us, like, you know, heights and snakes. Uh, but you could have an irrational fear maybe of, say, clowns um, or cause irrational fear in you. So those things have been conditioned together. And what we want to do is um, break apart that conditioning um, so that either stimulus on its own, clowns, you know, no longer give you that fear response. And this is something still used uh, in, in therapy and you know, cognitive interventions. So we've come to our first video. And uh, to watch this video, just look in the description. And the link will be there so you can check out an example of uh, classical conditioning uh, from the office. So that's behaviorism. And you can kind of see where this is heading. And the next perspective they called cognitive psychology. And really what they said is, okay, we've been looking at the input and the output, that's important, but we really want to start delving into this black box. We want to understand the mind, specifically what we call the mental processes of the mind. We're going to see many of these throughout the course, but some of the big examples are attention, memory, perception, language, basically all those wonderful things that our mind does uh, for us. And this per perspective, cognitive psychology, uh, became popular in the 1960s and continues to today. There are some newer kind of perspectives, um, but they haven't been so large to kind of overthrow cognitive psychology. Um, some of these other newer perspectives kind of um, exist still with Cognitive psychology being the main perspective. So what is happening in that the middle stage there in, in the mind? Well, we're going to introduce a framework for this called information processing. And it posits that there are three main stages of information processing between input and output. This is a very general, very broad framework. And the good thing about that is this can apply to many situations. Pick an everyday task, and you can probably think about it in terms of information processing. So the three stages are stimulus identification, response selection, and response programming. And we're going to talk about those three stages in this module, and we're going to see them come up throughout the rest of the course. All right, stimulus identification, sometimes abbreviated as SI. I do that on slides sometimes where I don't have room to write out the full stimulus identification. And this is simply knowing what is happening in the environment. Um, that can also include your body as well. So think of those nine sources of, of stimuli coming in. Our brain has to identify you know, what we see, what we hear, what we feel where our body is, you know, what's going on in us and in the world. And that is stimulus identification. Now, once we've identified kind of what's happening in the world and our bodies, we can go on to response selection. And this is deciding which response to make. So maybe you see a baseball flying towards you. You say, okay, there's a baseball flying towards me. Okay, well, what do I want to do? Do I want to move my hand and catch it? Do I want to move out of the way? Is it not going to hit me so I could just sit here and maybe yell heads up so someone else doesn't get hit? Uh, response selection, lots of possibilities that you might do in different situations, but it's kind of a simple stage in that you're deciding which response to make. It's on bold in this slide because the next module 
we're going to delve much deeper into response selection. Now, what you after you've decided what you want to do, so let's say I decide I want to catch the baseball, I then have to figure out how my muscles are going to do that. How do I get my hand to move up you know, at the right place at the right time to catch the baseball? And this is what we call response programming, organizing and initiating an action. And an interesting thing, unlike the previous stages, which we typically are consciously aware of, what we what's happening in the world we're consciously aware of what we want to do there are exceptions and we'll talk more about these but response programming we're not very conscious of this stage at all so i know that i want my hand to do this i tell it when to do that you know i'm in control i'm consciously aware of that but how i send signals to my muscles i have no idea how that happens and i don't mean from you know, uh, a scientific standpoint, we'll talk <laughs> a little more about, you know, how we innervate our muscles, uh, but just which muscles are activating when I do this, I, I, I don't know. I, my brain takes care of it for me. So response programming is interesting and difficult to study because we're typically not consciously aware of what occurs during that stage. So let's talk a little more about uh, the three stages. And for stimulus identification, we're gonna talk about in this module, and we'll see a little bit of it again in vision, but that's gonna be kind of it for the course. So stimulus identification, we wanna process the stimulus and use memory to determine what it is. We're gonna have a few modules later on about memory, because memory is very important when we're identifying stimuli. When we see something, we've probably seen it or something like it before. So we're always connecting with memory to help us identify uh, what we see. Now, stimulus identification is affected by the stimulus clarity, the stimulus intensity, and the modality. And we'll talk about those three examples. Another important part of stimulus identification is pattern recognition. Because when we see things in the world, they're not individual stimuli. So if we go back to that baseball example, a baseball is round, so that's one type of stimulus. Uh, it's white with red stitches. Um, it, it has kind of a, a leather look to it because it's made out of leather. And it's all those things together that tell us it's a baseball. So we're trying to identify patterns uh, to identify objects. There's a whole huge field dedicated to perception and stimulus identification. There's a whole course at Tech uh, if you're interested in, in, in delving more into this, especially because we won't see very much of it in this course. So stimulus clarity, the more clear or more in focus the stimulus is, the easier it is to identify. And this is pretty straightforward. But if I showed you the, the stimulus, uh, you know, a nice in focus, <laughs> focus, you would be able to say, um, to identify that word quickly. Now, these words, of course, would have to be random. It couldn't be the same one all, all the time. But if I then showed you another word that was very out of focus, it would take you longer to identify that. The more intense the stimulus, the easier it is to identify as well. And we can talk about the intensity of light. You know, is it a very faint light or very bright light? And we also talk about the intensity of sound. The so sound is me uh, measured in decibels. And let's look, uh, something very quiet here like whispering might be about 30 decibels. Different graphics show things slightly differently because this depends, you know, how loud is your friend whispering? How close are they to your ear? So it, it all depends. Uh, city traffic, you know, car traffic or truck traffic, you know, 70 to 80 decibels. A police siren, you know, very loud. Uh, but it, of course, would be louder if you're just outside the car versus inside the car, or if the police car is, you know, a street away. Uh, but I'm, you know, I'm assuming this is probably, you know, you're standing right beside the car, and it's going to be 120 decibels, so very loud. So if you're sitting with your eyes closed and I play you a sound, you have to identify what it is. You'd be faster at identifying, say, uh, a trombone because it's very loud uh, versus, you know, rustling leaves. 
All right, next up, modality. And the modality is simply the form of sensation. So we talked about we have those nine at least types of um, senses. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about modalities. And a very famous example is that your reaction time is different for different types of stimuli. Now, some things might be hard to do a reaction time test for thinking, you know, vestibular. I guess we could tilt your head. <laughs> You'd have to detect that as quickly as possible. That'd be probably a little hard to do. But three different types of reaction time tests that are fairly straightforward are touch. So you could be sitting there with your eyes closed and say, OK, as soon as you feel a touch on your hand, you know, press a button. And we measure your reaction time. And typically, we find very uh, short, fast reaction times. We could do another experiment again, uh, eyes closed. And now we're going to play a sound. And what we would see is that your reaction time is a little bit longer. Now, we would have to try to balance the intensity of these stimuli. And you know what is a moderate touch and what is a moderate sound? Yeah, that's a little hard to do. But typically, uh, our reaction time to sound is a little bit longer than to touch. We change the experiment again. Now your eyes are open, and maybe there's a light bulb in front of you. And as soon as it illuminates, press a button. So reaction time to light, we see that your reaction time is actually much longer. Now, why is that? Let's look at sound versus light. So let's go back for a second here. So sound versus light, sound much faster than light. There's a big difference here. So two, we're going to think about the stimulus. Um, how long does it take for our brain to uh, detect, for the stimulus to get translated in the brain? Um, Sorry, I should read the points here. It's right here. So we're going to think about two steps during the stimulus identification. First, we have to translate the sensory stimuli into neural codes. So there's a uh, sensory out there in the world. So think about the light. It turns on. We've got to get that light turning on that translated from a physical stimuli, a light, into neural codes in our brain. So that's step one. Once we've done that, once we've translated the sensory stimuli into a neural code, we then have to detect. Our brain has to say, OK, well, what just happened? What, what is happening in the world? And once we do that, we can then, say, press a button for a reaction time task. And we're going to look at these two processes for sound versus light. OK, first off, that translation process. So for sound, this is a mechanical process. So sound waves, you know, travel in the ear. They're going to go into the cochlea. And there, the, depending on the frequency of the sound, they will cause these little hairs to bend. And depending on the frequency, they'll, they'll bend different hairs. So in this example, they're saying, OK, that's a, a 4 kilohertz sound, for example. And these hairs here are sensitive to 4 kilohertz. So the sound will bend these ones over only. Not these ones that are sensitive to 1 kilohertz, not these that are sensitive to 16 kilohertz. But these will bend, and the bending of these hair cells will produce an action potential. And that's going to go down the auditory nerve uh, and into the brain. So when we hear a sound, there's a mechanical translation process. To see a light, so I think those rays of light, they're going to hit our retina. We'll talk more about this in the light section. And what we're going to see here is there's a chemical process uh, that translates the ray of light into an action potential. It's going to travel down the optic nerve you know, and off to the brain for more processing. So sound, mechanical, uh, vision, chemical. Now, this mechanical process is actually very fast, whereas the, the chemical process uh, for vision is slow. So already we have an advantage uh, for sound. We're going to be faster at detecting a sound because the translation into a neural code is shorter compared to vision and the chemical translation. What about step two? OK, so we now have action potentials going to the brain. There's now going to be parts of the brain that say, hey, 
what what is this action potential? What is it that I hear or what is it that I see? Now for sound, there's relatively few brain areas involved. We can see kind of a handful of them here. And we'll talk about a few of these later on uh, in the course. For vision, there are many brain areas. And it's almost kind of the whole brain uh, that is involved in processing visual information. Now, when few brain areas are involved in detecting a stimulus, they're going to be faster at doing that. Whereas when, when many brain areas have to coordinate to say, hey, what is it that I see? They're going to be slower. The analogy I like to give here is, let's say, you and uh, four of your friends are trying to decide which movie to see. You know, that's going to take some conversation, some coordination, but pretty soon you'll be able to figure out which movie you want to see. Now imagine you get together with 50 of your friends and try to decide which movie you want to see. It's going to take longer because there's going to be even more conversation. Maybe you've got to organize a vote. You know, it's more complicated, so it takes longer. So if we go back here, so remember that our reaction time is faster to sound uh, than to light. And that is the case for two reasons. Sound is faster at translating the sensory stimuli into a neural code. And for sound, we're also faster at stimulus detection because fewer brain areas are involved. Last thing for stimulus identification, and this is pattern recognition. So when we see things in the world, we're always trying to extract patterns. And a great example are faces. And we'll see uh, faces come up in the course uh, in the vision section and in the coordination section. So a face, there is an assembly of individual features. You know, there's a nose, there's lips, there's eyes, there's eyebrows, and so on. And if you see any individual feature, you probably won't know who that is, even if you see Say, for example, a close-up of, of an eye, of, you know, a close family member or a lifelong friend, you probably won't know, you won't be able to identify that individual unless there's something extremely unique uh, about that. So maybe like if they have, um, if they always wear contacts to make their eyes purple, sure, if you see a picture of a purple eye, you're probably going to guess that that's your friend. But typically to know whose face we're seeing, we need to assemble all of those stimuli into a recognizable pattern. This is an interesting face here from this research, faceresearch.org. And I, I made this face on that website. Uh, they have a bunch of standard images. And I think they have about 50 female faces, 50 male faces, all young adults, kind of standardized. So their, their, their heads are on the same position, almost like a passport photo. And I average 50 male and 50 female faces together, and you get this average face. So it's an androgynous face. You know, it's neither male nor female. The other thing interesting about it is it's a relatively attractive face. And that's because one thing that's attractive to, to us, at least in faces, is symmetry. And the average face is very symmetric, more so than any individual face. So if you take, you know, one face, maybe the ears are slightly off, but then there's someone else, the ears are a little the other way. Most people's ears are symmetric. You average all those together and you lose a lot of that noise or asymmetry. And the average face therefore ends up being quite uh, attractive and symmetric. Here's another example of a face. Um, we'll see this later on in the course. Uh, this was a, a famous artist who made faces out of objects. So here we have a face made out of, uh, I guess, fruits and vegetables. <laughs> and if we couldn't see the pattern here, you would just see the individual features like, oh, there's some grapes, there's a mushroom, but our brain is always extracting those patterns. And so from this, you know, we can see that they make a face. We recognize the pattern. Pattern recognition is very important in sports. And one thing we see with elite athletes who invested years into sports is they're very fast at recognizing patterns. Um, and this could be the quarterback, for example. From years of experience, they can very quickly recognize where the offense is, where the defense is, and what they should do. A non-expert player or just a, a casual observer would take much longer to recognize 
uh, the pattern, they'd likely be too slow to be an effective quarterback. This has been studied in a few different sports, and another way it's been studied is in chess, because in chess, pattern recognition is very important. And I think I have a note here about this. So I am not an expert chess player, uh, but I looked up uh, a, a chessboard with a, a specific pattern. And this pattern, an expert chess player, I think, would recognize probably very quickly. And this is called the Siberian Trap. So there's all sorts of names for different uh, positions and patterns in chess. So here, black has set a trap for white. Um, if you are an expert uh, chess player, and when you saw that, you recognize it, you know, leave a, a comment uh, down below because I'd, I'd be very curious if this is something, you know, very easy for a chess player, or maybe that's a very sophisticated uh, pattern. Okay, so just to summarize, we have our three main stages of information processing, stimulus identification, response selection, and response programming. In some experiments and Donder subtraction logic, which is coming up, we're going to need to divide a few of these stages into substages. So stimulus identification, we're going to break into two substages. Response selection will stay as just one stage. And response programming, we also need to break down into uh, two substages. So often in the course, we'll be talking about this three-stage model. Other times, like in Donder's subtractive method, we're going to need to talk about a slightly more detailed kind of five-stage or substage model. So let me introduce those substages now. So stimulus identification, there's two substages. There's stimulus detection. And this is just knowing that a stimulus has appeared or has occurred. And then there's stimulus identification. This is going a further step to know what the stimulus is. And I'll try to give you a couple examples of this. So let's say a friend startles you. They jump out, they yell boo. You know, you're startled, you might scream, and you've gone through stimulus detection. What your mind has realized is that there's a threat you know, in front of you, you're startled. As you then take more time to go through stimulus identif identification, you then realize, oh, it's just my friend, they startled me. And that second stage, you know, then, you know, reassures you that you're, you know, not being attacked. So that's maybe one example where you can kind of see these two substages being separate. And we do go through detection before we go through identification. And a note here, I didn't name these substages, but unfortunately, you know, the second substage, stimulus identification, has the same name as the overall stage, uh, which is confusing. So let's do an experiment where we can try to feel a difference between detection and identification. And in this first experiment, there's going to be two trials. What I want you to do is make a response as soon as you detect a face. So in a second, there'll be a white screen. I'm going to bring a face up. As soon as you detect a face, you don't have to know whose face it is, just that there's a face on the screen. I'm not going to trick you. It's just going to be a face. So as soon as you see something appear on the screen, you know, make a response. You can just maybe you know, make a response with your hand. Uh, and think about how long it takes you to make that response. OK, here we go. Experiment one, detect the face. All right, here we go. OK, one more trial. So again, make a response as soon as you see a face. You don't need to identify the face, just detect that there is a face. OK, great. Now, experiment two, what you're going to have to do is now make a response as soon as you identify the face. So you'll have to go through stimulus detection. Oh, a face has appeared. Then you're going to have to have some additional time to identify, OK, well, whose face is this? And think about or feel how long your reaction time is. And what you'll probably find is that it feels longer because you have to go through that second substage of identifying the face. All right, two trials. Here we go. So make a response as soon as you know whose face it is. OK, one more. When I've done this in class before, typically students can feel a difference. You might not, though, but I guarantee you, if we brought you into the lab, we did this as a very controlled experiment, we measured your reaction time precisely, 
you would be faster at detecting a face versus identifying a face. Because to detect a face, you just have to go through the first stage. To identify a face, you have to go through both stages, and that takes longer. It will increase your reaction time. All right, response selection, thankfully, stays as just one stage. And we're going to see much more of this in our next two modules. We're going to talk about the Heck-Hyman law, and then we'll talk about stimulus response compatibility. But we'll save those uh, for later. All right, next up, response programming. So response programming, we can also split into two substages. So remember the definition of response programming, programming was organizing and initiating an action. Well, those are the two substages. The first is organizing the action, and then initiating the action is the second substage. And typically organizing the action, this is the part that occurs outside of conscious awareness. I don't know how my brain gets the motor commands ready to send to my muscles, but I typically do tell, consciously tell my brain when to send that motor command out to my hand. So if I want to you know, make a, a, a fist, my brain has prepared those motor commands outside of conscious awareness, and then I tell it when to release those to, to form a fist. We're going to see lots of examples of response programming kind of peppered throughout the course uh, in, in several modules. So here are those two substages to be explicit. Response programming is organizing the action, and response initiation is initiating the action. And again, unfortunately, the name of the first substage is the same as the overall stage, which is, again, confusing. So we've got our three-stage model of information processing and then a more detailed five-stage model. And we're going to need this for Donder's subtraction method, um, which we're going to discuss now. Ooh, we're going to talk about traffic intersection example first. <laughs> Ah, we have a couple of things to go through before we hit to Donders. OK, so uh, in textbooks, when they talk about information processing, they always like to give this classic, classic example of a traffic intersection. So let's say you're driving up to an intersection, and the light changes from green to yellow. So we can now think about what goes on in information processing. And we'll just use the three-stage model here. So stimulus identification, we need to detect what has changed? So hopefully we're looking at the lights, uh, and there's that change from green to yellow, and that's very you know salient and important when we're driving. So hopefully that lets our uh, you know reaches our awareness. We're paying attention, and we realize that oh, in the world the traffic light has changed from green to yellow. So that's stimulus identification. Now comes response selection. We have to decide what to do. And context is very important here. You know, if we're a long way away from this intersection, then yeah, we've got plenty of time. You know, we'll slow down, we'll stop. But we might be in the middle of the intersection when the light changes from green to yellow. And in that case, you know, we shouldn't stop in the middle of the intersection. We should keep going through. And then, of course, there's, you know, the middle cases where, you know, you're just about to enter and it changes yellow. And then we might have to rely on our memory to help us. So is it a rainy day? Might my stopping distance be further? Is there a car right behind me the last I checked? If there is, maybe I shouldn't slam on the brakes because they might hit me. So response selection. Let's say in this case we're a, a, a good distance from life. We can safely stop. So we decide the response we want to make is to stop the car. Now we need to go through response programming. We need to prepare those motor commands. This occurs subconsciously. So somehow my, my brain says, all right, uh, to stop the car, I need to take my foot off the gas and move it onto the brake. And we control you know, quite precisely how quickly we take it off the gas and how hard we're going to press the brake depending on the situation. So we prepare those motor commands. Uh, we say, OK, yep, I want to do that. So start executing those motor commands. And then we, um, our motor apparatus, our muscle, accomplishes uh, that selected action. Another great way to look at information processing, and this is going to be very important in this course, 
is in a reaction time task. And we could do that, and there's research that does that in uh, traffic examples, often in driving simulators where things can be more precisely controlled. So they might have you driving through an intersection, you know, change the light from green to red at maybe an inopportune time, sorry, from green to yellow at an inopportune time, and look at your reaction time uh, to that stimuli. There's lots of fancy um, driving simulators where they, they do research like this. But we're going to talk about just a very generic reaction time task, kind of a typical reaction time task. And in these, what we typically see are a warning signal. Uh, then there's a, a period of time until we get the go signal. And this duration of time between the warning signal and the go signal we call the for period. So think about the amount of time before the go signal. So we get the go signal. And at some point later, we then decide um, our, sorry, our movement begins. We've gone through information processing. So the duration of time between the go signal and movement beginning, this is reaction time. And this measures the duration of information processing. Now we begin a movement and then sometime later our movement ends and that period of time we call movement time. Now this might seem a little abstract, so let's give this a, a, a better example. And that is a sprint start in a, um, I think we'll look at a 100 meter race and also a 110 meter uh, hurdle. So we're gonna look here at a, an older video. Uh, this is um, Flo Jo or Florence Griffith Joyner, the last I checked, still record holder in the women's 100 meter race with a time of 1049. And this record has stood for quite a while. She set it back in 1988. So as you watch this clip, and to find the clip, just look in the description of the video, I want you to think about, okay, what is the warning signal? What is the go signal? When does movement begin, and when does movement end? So give this a watch, and then come back. Okay, so let's map out a sprint start onto our kind of typical reaction time task. So the warning signal, uh, that's when the uh, speaker, the, the announcer, the official beginning of the race, the starter, <laughs> that probably has a name, uh, says set. So the race, uh, the sprinters now know that they're about to get the go signal. So that's their warning signal. The go signal, that was the gun, right? The, the firing of the gun, the bang, that's the go signal. The time between these is the four period. Movement begins. Well, visually, although it wasn't the best quality, you could look for as soon as those sprinters start to move. And that is the beginning of movement. And what we know is that as soon as you begin to move, you must have finished information processing because you've sent out those motor commands. So those athletes during the reaction time, um, back here, have gone through those stages of information processing. And this is vital because it gives us a way to measure those stages. You know, it's great to come up with these ideas. Oh, I guess you identify a stimulus, you select a response, you program a response. But what we need is a way to measure those. If we can't measure those, it's kind of worthless to come up with this framework. But thankfully, we can measure the duration of information processing with reaction time. So movement begins, the, the sprinters start running, uh, movement ends, we could say that's when they cross the finish line, at least that's when the movement for the race ends. Uh, and, and the movement time is the time between movement beginning and movement ending. So how long did it take uh, the sprinter to finish the race? Well, that is the reaction time and the movement time. So at the go signal, the clock starts counting. And once they cross the finish line, the clock captures their their what we call total response time, which is reaction time plus movement time. So a sprinter is trying to have a short reaction time and a short movement time. Now the movement time is, is the larger contribution to reaction time. This is maybe 100 milliseconds, and for elite sprinter, this is more uh, like 10 seconds or you know nine-ish seconds. 
but they're both important. The sprinter needs to have a short reaction time and a short movement time. Now, this is an interesting uh, example and application of information processing. So if anyone saw this race, it was just about a year ago, uh, and Devin Allen, a, a U.S. sprinter and a football player, um, false started, and he was eliminated from this race. In sprinting, uh, the rule currently is that if you have one false start, you're out, you're eliminated. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, you could false start twice before you're eliminated, uh, but now it's just once, which is, you know, very severe. And you might think, what is a false start? Well, that's when you go, you, you initiate your movement before the go signal. And that would make sense. But <laughs> the criteria for a false start is actually, you can't begin to move, you can't initiate your movement until 100 milliseconds after the go signal. Now, why is that? Well, it comes back to information processing. So here's the go signal. Here's movement initiation, and in sprinting, they say this has to be at least 100 milliseconds. And the idea is you can't instantaneously identify the go signal, select your response, and program your response. And some caveats coming up about that. But there is, there's a, a small, finite time that you need to, as a sprinter, spend to go uh, to, to determine you've heard the stimulus and to initiate your, your motor command. So in other words, if your reaction time is 10 milliseconds, for example, I say, well, that's, that must be a false start. Because although you had a very short reaction time, it's not long enough for you to have heard the ghost signal and reacted to it. You must have anticipated. And in this race, um, I'll pause in a second so you can watch it. Uh, Devin Allen was eliminated I think this was the, the finals of the world championships, 110 meter sprint, uh, sorry, hurdles. And he was eliminated for false starting and his reaction time was 99 milliseconds. One millisecond longer and it would have been fine. Heartbreak. So take it out, uh, take a look and come back here. So with reaction time being you know, vitally important for cognitive psychology and uh, for a sprint start, you might wonder, well, how is it measured in both in the lab, which we'll get to, and for sprinters? We'll take a look at this video uh, to see a bit of an advertisement for Seiko's measurement systems. There are a few different companies that, that sell this high-end equipment to Olympics and NCAA uh, athletics, but this was kind of the best video I could find that explains how it works. So watch this one and then and come back. So what you hopefully saw there uh, was that the way they measure uh, movement initiation is on the starting blocks, they have four sensors. And when the racer um, becomes set and still, they're looking for a constant amount of force on that load cell. Kind of like when you stand on a scale and you're still, you know, your weight is constant. If I start wobbling around the scale, that weight changes. Same with the sprinter. They've got their feet on the starting blocks and they need a constant amount of force. And that's their baseline level. And then what happens is you get the go signal and eventually after they go through information processing and reaction time, the amount of force will increase as they push off the blocks. And what they measure is the time from the go signal until the force increases on the block. And that is the sprinter's reaction time. And for Devin Allen, it was 99 milliseconds, one millisecond too fast for the current uh, criterion. Now that actually brings up an interesting point. It was not always 100 milliseconds. I don't think I was aware of this as a kid, but until 1990, your sprint start uh, had to be 120 milliseconds or slower. And as athletes got faster and faster, they decreased that in 1990 to the current standard of 100 milliseconds. Now, is that fair? Um, you know, did Devin Allen have, have a, just a fast, good reaction time? Or did he anticipate? Hard to say, but some research um, that has been um, 
funded by um, one of the athletic foundations, uh, they asked reaction time researchers to, to, to estimate the minimum reaction time in a, in a sprint start task. And in this one study, these researchers estimated that the quickest your reaction time could be you know, in a trained sprinter is 78 milliseconds. And that is actually much faster than the current standard of 100. And at the end of this article, they actually recommended that the standard be moved from 100 uh, down to 80. And if that had been in place, then Devin Allen's sprint start you know, would have been perfectly legal. Okay, now finally to our example of Donder's subtractive method. And here we're gonna see reaction time applied in a laboratory setting to delve deeper into the stages of information processing. This is a very old study, uh, originally published in 1868, um, you know, and then republished kind of 100 years later in 1969, which is you know, kind of still a long time ago. So this is very fundamental uh, reaction time research. So who was this Donders? Well, it was Professor Franciscus Cornelius Donders, you know, great name. Uh, he was a Dutch ophthalmologist, so he was, uh, you know, studied the eye, but he also got interested in kind of reaction time to visual stimuli. He lived from 1818 to 1889. Um, so yeah, mostly kind of studied the eye, but kind of got into reaction time and discovered maybe the most um, influential research of his career. At his time, there was an awareness of these stages of information processing. And they knew they could measure them all at once with reaction time tasks. But Donders, he wanted to say, hey, can we measure each individual stage? So for example, let's say we measure the reaction time of a participant and it's 300 milliseconds. We could say, okay, all five stages take 300 milliseconds, but how long does response selection take? Does it take 250 milliseconds? Does it take 50 milliseconds? It's gonna be part of the 300, but how long does each stage take? And those should all then add up to say 300 in this example. So how Donders tackled that was by looking at some fundamental and some new reaction time tasks. So the first task he looked at was what we still call two choice reaction time. And here, basically, there's two different stimuli, and one requires a left response, and one requires a right response. So two stimuli, two responses. And the way they did it in this case is they had a light, and that light could turn on red, for example. And if it was red, you were told, you know, press the red button. Or the light could turn on green, and you were told if it turns on green, then press the right button. So I hope I said red, left, green, right. <laughs> So two choice because there's a choice between two stimulus response alternatives. So a fairly straightforward task. You know, this is not, uh, you know, neuroscience or or or, um, you know, brain surgery, but we'll see how and why this is important. Okay, let's try this for ourselves. So if you use your hands on your desk or on your lap, if the light is red, left response; if it's green, right response. I think we'll try four or five tries. Okay, here we go. Okay, good, let's keep going. Okay, so try to remember how long your reaction time was there. Let's map this onto our typical reaction time task. So in Donder's task, there wasn't a warning signal. Um, you knew there were trials coming, so they didn't really need a warning. Sometimes experiments have one, sometimes they don't. The go signal with the light illuminating, which could be green or red. Now, when does the movement begin? Well, it's as soon if you're, say, pressing a button, which they did in this task, a telegraph key, actually. Uh, as soon as you start to move your finger down, that would be when the movement begins. When does the movement end? It's a very short movement. You'd be pressing a button down. So that would only take a few milliseconds. So reaction time, the time between the go signal and soon as you start to see movement in the finger, 
that's the reaction time, and we can use it to measure the duration of information processing. There's also the movement time, and that would be very short in this case, from the moving beginning to the movement ending, and probably only takes 10, 20 milliseconds to, to press a button. Now, in this example, two-choice reaction time, uh, Donders argued that in two-choice, you have to go through all five of these stages and substages of information processing. So here's one summary table, and we're going to kind of add to this as we introduce new tasks. So what Donder said is in two-choice, during the reaction time, you have to go through all five of these substages. Okay, so that's our first uh, task. Now, we could measure participants. You could have them do this task, and let's say their reaction time was 400 milliseconds. We would know that the sum duration of these five stages is 400 milliseconds. But remember, Donners wants to measure these stages individually. So to do that, or at least to get closer to doing that, he looked at two new reaction time tasks. And the first one was called simple reaction time. It's simple reaction time because it's the easiest possible reaction time task. Sometimes I call this one choice reaction time because there's one stimuli usually uh, and one response. Here there was actually two stimuli. And what would happen is same light as before, if it turned on red, you know, press the, the blue button. Just, there's one single button now. And if it's green, same thing, make that same response. So simple reaction time, doesn't matter if it's green or red, just press the blue button. Let's try this for ourselves and see if you can feel a difference in your reaction time compared to two choice. Oh, yeah. Okay, here we go. Okay, so when I do this in the class, usually most people find that simple reaction time is shorter or faster than two choice reaction time. Now, why is that? Well, let's go back to our model of information processing. In simple reaction time, you know what you want to do on every single trial. You want to press the button and your brain likes to be efficient. It says, okay, well, I need to press the button. I'm trying to do this quickly. So before I get the go signal, I'm going to select the response, press the button, and I'm going to program the response. I'm going to get those motor commands ready and waiting in my brain. And if I do that before the go signal, that's going to allow me to have a short reaction time, which is what you're trying to do in this task. Now, I am going to have to do some processing after the go signal, but only two stages. We'll need to detect that the go signal has occurred. So you need to say, oh, a light has turned on. We don't need to identify the color of the light, because in this case, it doesn't matter if it's green or red. As soon as the light turns on, we should make that response we've previously uh, prepared. So, oh, yeah, I saw a light. Don't worry about the color. Let's just go ahead and initiate that response that we previously selected and prepared. And sometimes we call this you know, pre-programming. We've prepared this before the go signal. So reaction time is short because we only have to go through two stages um, during the reaction time. And two stages is going to be much shorter than going through all five stages like we saw in two choice. So if we go to our summary table, what we're seeing here are the stages involved during the reaction time period. If we go back here, remember, there are four stages involved, but critically, there's only two of them that contribute to your reaction time. So Donder suggested that in simple reaction time, it's the sum duration of just two stages. So we haven't isolated any individual stage, but if we want to measure the sum duration of all five, we could give you a two-choice reaction time task. And if we want to measure the sum duration of just two stages, we would give you a simple reaction time task. Now, Donner has introduced one more reaction time task, and that was a go-no-go -go, uh, reaction time task. And here, the way it worked is there was a single response, so pressing the blue button, but there are two different stimuli, and we've actually seen this in all three tasks. The light could turn on green or red. 
here the color made a difference. If it was red, you are not supposed to press the button. So that's the no-go part of the task. Alternatively, if it's green, you should go. So green, go, red, stop, if you will. So this isn't really simple reaction time. It's not two choice. It's kind of in the middle. It's a one and a half choice, or it's more appropriately a go, no, go uh, reaction time task. And let's try this and think about how long your reaction time is. Here we go. So red, don't press the button or don't make a response. Green, make a response. OK, good job. That it's typically difficult to tell how fast or slow you are at go, no, go compared to simple and two choice. If we brought you in the lab, what we see is it falls somewhere in the middle, It's usually a bit slower than simple, but not as long as two choice. But it's usually not that much longer than simple. So we can see that in your reaction times, but it's hard to feel the difference. It's very easy to feel a hundred millisecond difference, but the difference between simple and go no go smaller than that. We'll see some example numbers later. And eventually that's hard for us to perceive that small a difference in reaction time. So what did Donder suggest about go no go? Well, he said, you know what? I think your brain will still select a response. If I'm going to respond, I know I want to press the button. So I'm going to go ahead and prepare that in advance. I'm going to be efficient so that I can be fast. Now, after the go signal, we're going to have to go through three stages. So remember, simple, it was just two. For go, no, go, there's three. We have to detect that a light is turned on, but we also need to know the color of the light. So we have to identify whether it's a green light or a red light. If it's a red light, we won't do anything more. If it's a green light, we'll go ahead and we'll initiate that pre-programmed response. So go, no, go should be a little bit longer than simple because it involves three stages, whereas go, no, go involved two. And just a reminder, yes, there are five stages here, but critically, there's only three stages that occurred during the reaction time, the part that we're measuring. So here's our summary table. And Donders argued that go, no, go is the sum duration of stimulus detection, stimulus identification, and response initiation. Again, we haven't isolated any individual stage, but we can measure different, we can measure subsets of stages in three different ways. Ah, here are those uh, examples. So I, I tried doing this experiment. I, I run this with my grad class. So I, I tried it, uh, I think, the last semester. And my results follow the, the expected pattern. So reaction time for two choice is the longest. Simple is the shortest. And there's a, about a 200 millisecond difference here for me. And that would be something that you can feel and see. That's a, a very big difference in reaction time. But the difference between simple and go, no, go, you know, this is about 50 milliseconds. That's kind of small. And you might not feel that small of a difference. But it, it is there, and we can see it when we precisely measure your reaction time. OK, we've gone halfway through Donders. Uh, and let's just kind of apply what we've learned so far. So down here, I have our summary table. I have my reaction time values. And we're going to use these for three questions. So how long does it take me to go through stimulus detection and response initiation? So how can we answer this based on what we know from Donders? Well, let's see, stimulus detection and response initiation. We've got two stages, and those are the two stages that occur in simple reaction time. So if we want to know how long it takes for me to do those two stages together, we can just look at my results for simple reaction time, which is 223 milliseconds. Another question we can answer based on what we know so far is how long does it take for me to go through stimulus detection, stimulus identification, response selection, response programming, and response initiation? So not each individually, but all five stages together. Well, that occurs during two choice reaction time. And my reaction time there was 424 milliseconds. And finally, as you might predict the last question here, how long does it take for me to go through stimulus detection, 
GMS identification and response initiation. So let's see, detection, initiation, and response initiation. So we just want those three stages, which is go, no, go. So the answer here is 288 milliseconds. Now, that's not the end of Donders, and remember that it's called Donders subtraction method, and we haven't done any subtraction yet, uh, and that's what we're going to do now. So there's three other ways to look at different subsets of these stages, but it's not three new reaction time tasks. It's by subtracting from uh, two tasks from that list of three that we already have, and, and let me show you that. So there's three subtractions. One is go, no, go minus uh, simple. The other is two choice minus simple. And the third is two choice minus go, no, go. And those are really the only three options. You could do, say, simple minus go, no, go, but you get a negative reaction time, which you know, isn't physiologically possible. So it's not really relevant in this situation. So let's look at this first one, go, no, go minus simple. So mathematically, you know, this is straightforward. Let's use my numbers again. So go to go reaction time was 288, and my simple reaction time was 223. So, you know, 288 minus 223, you know, we can solve this, or PowerPoint can solve it for me. <laughs> it's 65 milliseconds. But what is that telling us about information processing? And that's the more interesting part. And we can think about that by doing the subtraction again, but instead of using numbers, using stages. So go, no, go is detection, initiation, oops, sorry, detection, identification, and initiation. So we're going to put in those three stages there for go, no, go. Now we're going to subtract simple, which is detection and initiation, detection and initiation. So we're going to do this subtraction. Now we have to remember, you know, uh, bed mass, or more specifically, when we have a negative here, we have to distribute that negative to both terms inside the brackets. So if we draw this out, it's stimulus detection, stimulus identification, response initiation, and then minus stimulus detection and minus response initiation. And you can think of this as positive one stimulus detection and negative one stimulus detection. So positive one minus one equals zero. Or in other words, stimulus detection, the positive and negative ones cancel each other out. We also have positive one response initiation and negative one response initiation. Those are also going to cancel themselves out. And what we're left with is just the duration of stimulus identification. And this was the closest uh, Donders got to isolating a single stage. Here he did. He could find out how long it takes you to go through stimulus identification. For me, on average, it's 65 milliseconds. Now, he didn't come up with a task, one task that measures just stimulus identification, but we isolated that through this subtraction of go, no, go minus simple. All right, we've got two more subtractions to go through. Ooh, here's a depiction of that using the table, and this might help. So think of go, no, go, it involves these three stages, and we've got simple involves these two stages, and if we're subtracting simple from go, no, go, these two stages cancel out, these cancel out, and we're left with just the duration of stimulus identification. All right, two more subtractions. Here's our next one, two choice minus simple. So let's start easy with the numbers. So for me, two choice is 424, simple is 223. So that's 201 milliseconds. This is a big difference in reaction time, something that's easy to feel. Um, if you're the participant, or if I'm watching a participant, I would be able to see that they're slower in two choice than simple. But what does this tell us about information processing? Well, let's subtract our stages. So two choice, all five stages, simple. We saw that last time. So these two stages, we're going to have to distribute the negative. So we'll get rid of the brackets. We've distributed the negative here. Our stimulus detections will cancel. We've got positive one minus one. And we have a positive response initiation, a negative response initiation. Positive 1 minus 1 equals 0. They're going to cancel out. And here, we're left with the duration, the sum duration of three stages. So Donders wasn't able to isolate any other individual stages, but this is a unique subset. 
If we want to know how long are these, just these three specific stages, the only way we can do that is by subtracting two choice from simple. Sorry, subtracting simple from two choice. If we look at that in table format, here's two choice, here's simple. These stages will cancel. These ones will cancel. And this subtraction, what it leaves us with is the sum duration of these three middle stages, identification, selection, and programming. Which for me, oh, that's where I, uh, oh, sorry, two, 201 milliseconds, that's right. So it takes me 201 milliseconds to go through these three stages. We don't know if it's 100 here, one here, and 100 here, but we know all three together sum to 201 milliseconds. All right, last subtraction. So the last unique subtraction we can do is two choice minus go, no, go. So numerically, that's 424 minus 288 is 136 milliseconds. What does that represent? Well, we've got our two, the stages involved in two choice. We've got three stages involved in go, no, go. We're going to distribute that negative to all three terms. And then these are going to cancel out some of our other stages. So we've got positive and negative stimulus detection, positive and negative stimulus identification, positive and negative response initiation, and that leaves us with the sum duration of response selection and response programming. So for me, it takes me 130 milliseconds on average to select a response and program a response. Finally, in table format, we've got two choice, go, no, go, common stages will cancel out, and we're left with the sum duration of selection and programming. Okay, so using our subtractions, we can apply Donders in three new ways. And um, these three questions will involve that. So first, how long does it take for me to go through stimulus identification? Well, we can't just say it's the duration of two choice or simple or go, no, go because we want to isolate a single stage and none of those different tasks do that. So we're going to need a subtraction. So to isolate just stimulus identification, if we take go, no, go, subtract simple, these will cancel out, these will cancel out, and we'll be left with just this. So to answer this question, we need to take 288 and minus 223 um, to get 65 milliseconds. So how long does it take Dr. Blinch to go through stimulus identification, response selection, and response programming? So we're trying to isolate these three middle stages. So if we start with two choice, it's a good start, but we want to get rid of the first and last stage. And we can do that by subtracting simple reaction time. So 424 minus 223 gives us 201 milliseconds. That's how long it takes me to go through those three stages on average. And lastly, how long does it take for me to go through response selection and response programming? Okay, so we want to isolate these two stages. So let's start with two choice, but we want to get rid of these three stages, which we can do with go, no, go. So we'll do 424 minus 288. So it takes me 130 milliseconds to go through response selection and response programming. So if we take our second application there and remember our first application, there's six different ways we can use Donders. There's three different tasks that involve different stages and substages. And then there's three subtractions, which will isolate three different subsets of stages. And it might sound a little complicated, but any question I could ask you about Donders, you know, there's only six possible ways to answer it. And what you could do is go through all of them. So if there's a question on Donders, then there's some in the sample questions, and I'm sure there's some on the test. Uh, you could say, okay, well, is the answer two choice? No. Is it simple? No. Is it go, no, go? Oh, yes, it is. Great. Um, or, you know, if it's not, then is it this one? Is it this one? Is it this one? And, you know, it, you really only have to try six times <laughs> to get the right answer. Or you'll have to think about it in six different ways. What I like to do, I have a little heuristic here, is when I, uh, I'm trying to answer a question on Donders, I first ask, are the requested stages uh, one of the three reaction time tasks? So um, are you being asked for what the sum duration of 
identification and initiation. So those two stages, remember, are simple reaction time. So if they are, then we can just look up, well, what is simple reaction time? You know, and you're done. But if you're being asked for a certain um, stages to combine together, that's not one of the three tasks. Well, we're going to have to use one of the subtractions. And there's only three subtractions. So you can kind of follow this. So instead of having to go through all six, you can make this initial decision. So you know, OK, is it one of the tasks or is it one of the three subtractions? Just a little update on Donders kind of to bring it into the modern era. Now, Donders is still applicable today. And for example, in this uh, paper, part of my uh, dissertation, I did look at two choice versus simple reaction time. Uh, and I subtracted those to isolate these three stages. What has changed since Donders time is we no longer believe that go, no go is exactly what Donders uh, thought it was composed of. Now on the test, in the sample questions, we'll still use the Donders logic uh, that was presented, but I just wanted to kind of let you know that go no go is not exactly, uh, what we think it is now is different than what Donders thought. Although I think it's still amazing that, although it's been a long time since Donders research, that much of it has, has survived intact. So what happens in go, no, go? Well, more recent research, and this is one example, has suggested that go, no, go is actually very similar to two choice. Um, so the idea is that if you're told that you might have to go or you might not go, Donder said, OK, well, you probably select and prepare that response in advance. More recent research has suggested that the mind is efficient or lazy, depending on how you think about it, and it says, hey, if there's a chance I'm not going to have to go, I'm not going to prepare that in advance. I'm not going to waste resources to prepare a movement that I might not need. So what we think happens now in Go No Go is you go through all five stages, but response selection isn't as difficult as it is in two choice, because it's kind of like one and a half choices. You're just deciding between going and not going, and that's a little different than deciding between left and right. And because this is a bit different than this, you know, we can't really subtract these very well. You know, these stages would cancel, these would cancel, these would cancel, and these would cancel. But this two choice subtracting one and a half choices kind of leaves us with half a choice, <laughs> which is interesting to think about, but not a very clean subtraction. Uh, so nowadays, when Donders is used, we'll see two choice, we'll see simple, we'll see their subtraction, uh, but we don't often thrown go, no, go into the mix. More recent research using electroencephalography, or EEG, this uh, cap here shown by Stephen Colbert that, that uh, measures brain activity via small electrical potentials from your brain that travel through your scalp. Um, this has been used to further divide uh, information processing into individual stages. Um, so with EEG, it's actually quite straightforward to divide stimulus identification from response selection and response uh, program. So Donder's mission has progressed in, in, in recent eras, and there's still research that's going on with EEG and other technologies to further differentiate you know, within these substages and uh, even the substages of response programming. All right, so great job. We've made it to the end of our first module. Um, take a look at those sample questions, and then good luck on the test.